Where I grew up, there's this strange species of juniper tree, mostly isolated in central Oregon, with a similar version in the Sierras of California. It's known as the western juniper, or Juniperus occidentalis. They're kind of a wacky tree, very dry and almost weed-like if you see how little they need to sprout up. They seem to need very little to flourish, and almost appear to be made from simple dust, dirt, and combined with maybe a few drops of water. This species of juniper has very few uses. They're dirty, bad for firewood, not usable for gin, hard to chop down, grow like weeds, and I've wondered for many years if there was something special you could make from them. One unique property of these trees is that some of the branches grow in a very twisty, windy, decorative fashion and shape. You have to hunt quite a bit for an aesthetic shape or version, but many people use these mangled, distorted limbs for furniture or other decorative framing. Besides the decorative furniture, I still wanted to find some slightly askew project to integrate these strange trees and branches to make something out of them that is slightly out of sight of their small number of predictable uses. I wanted to inlay bronze sections into the juniper branches, a technique I developed working for an artist in the past. I start by drawing a line, marking the exact area I want to replace with bronze in the future. Then I use a razor to score the line into the wood, which will make an indent to show it as a positive in the next part of the process, which is making a rubber mold of this area. Only a portion of this needs to be covered with rubber, so I try to tape up and cover the rest of the branch to keep the rubber and mess off of everywhere else. The tape didn't stick very well, but it's better than nothing. It kind of looks like a weird butcher shop wrapping some sort of strange meat. After everything is wrapped up, it's time to make a mold of the marked and scored off area. We start by mixing some Mold Max silicone rubber. The first layer goes on thin to grab all of the fine details and allow it to cure. Then add it up in layers to build up the thickness. Once the rubber is thick enough, about four coats, it needs a rigid shell called a mother mold. I use burlap straps as a reinforcement filler to keep the plaster of Paris together on this mother mold. The rubber was really runny in the application and a lot of it's useless at this point, so it gets trimmed back closer to the scored in lines from the beginning. One of the final steps of the mold making process is the plaster mother mold. Along with the burlap strips, this is a hard shell that cradles the rubber mold and the wax pattern and assures it consistently stays the same shape and form as the original section of the wood that was molded. The burlap strips get dipped in the wet plaster and layered over top of the rubber. This gives them structure and keeps the plaster of Paris from becoming too crumbly or dis disintegrating later on. And then once everything is hardened and dried, it's time to demold and clean everything up. The tape and butcher paper was a good idea, but I don't know how much it actually helped to keep the rest of the branch clean. Here's the final product of the mold. You see the mirror image of the branch section? Embedded within this rubber is the score line I cut into the branch at the very beginning. This will be an easy guide to help me trim off the excess in a later step of the process. I forgot to mention this earlier, but for this project I'm doing the lost wax version of casting. That involves the entire rubber mold process from before so that I have a pattern to make the exact replica of the section of tree branch that I'm trying to cast. The rubber mold is a negative image of the wood, and now you need to reverse the reverse back onto a one-to-one -one duplicate of the original surface. That's done in wax pouring stage of the process. You use a special art casting wax with very low viscosity so it stays super runny and flows into all of the smallest wood grain details and texture. This wax is designed specifically for bronze casting. It has properties that make it rigid enough to hold its shape to the original, but also soft enough that you can work with it, trim it, bend it, or alter the surface with tooling. And after all of that, here you can see the duplicate area of the tree branch.
So before anyone complains that I'm not doing this right or this isn't a good way to do this, I'll preface with the fact that I'm not a woodworker and I know nothing about working with wood. I'm not really doing anything extraneous or skilled, I just needed to carve out the cavity to make room to fit the wax inside of. This is the beginning of fitting the inlay, so it's not super important and it's a little bit messy I'm sure. For this section, I did actually buy some carbides made for carving wood. This part is a little bit more important. I'm doing a semi-rough cut along the razor line that I scored at the beginning of the video. This is where things start to matter a little bit more. This exact score line is also in the wax pattern I just made, so it's more critical that these two lines match up later on. It's not shown here, but I went ahead and trimmed the wax pattern along the embedded score line. At this point, they should be a pretty close match, but wax is warped, and I didn't cut a perfect line in the wood. But I still have a lot of room and time left to make small adjustments to try to line them up as nicely as possible. After finishing the cuts on both halves, now it's just an endless game of making minor adjustments, carving out, trimming, and scraping. In some places the wax is close to a quarter of an inch thick, so I have to hog out quite a bit of the thickness from the wood. Also, this part of is sort of a catch-22. I'm doing all of this fine detail work to fit these together, but when this gets poured in bronze, the metal will contract a small amount and this whole pattern will no longer fit. I just do as much work in this stage as possible due to the wax being a lot easier to work with compared to metal for making small adjustments. I will basically get this to 99% close fit and by the time it's in metal it'll probably be closer to like 95%. Now that the fit is 99% complete it's time to sprue up the wax. Sprueing as you'll see later is establishing channels for which molten metal will flow through to direct bronze into the areas of the wax patterns that I've made. The sprues also act as a frame structure to hold the shape that I just spent so much time trying to achieve. Also, when the bronze cools, it retracts and torques a little bit, and these sprue systems will prevent that when the metal completely cools and solidifies. Also, I kind of want to breeze through some of these next sections of the video. I've done more detailed versions of these processes before if you check out some of my other videos. I wanted this one to be more about the work of the inlay and less about the boring parts of the casting process. Once again, I sped through this portion of the process. Basically, it's creating a hard ceramic shell made from silica sand, meant to pour metal into. You dip it in a wet slurry solution and subsequent layers of sand until you build up a thick outside coating. Essentially, what this makes is a vessel in which the molten bronze can be poured into. This ceramic vessel is now imprinted with all of the wax and wood textures, which once again create a negative copy of the pattern. This now ceramic texture will be what the bronze forms to, creating a final copy of the branch section in metal. And now that the wax is encased of inside of a ceramic shell, it needs a hole cut in the top of it so that all of the wax can be melted and evacuated out. Then it goes into a 1200 degree oven to melt the wax out and to preheat the ceramic. The preheat helps the molten bronze flow when it's poured inside. If the shell were cold, this would chill the metal as it entered and pre prevent it from traveling to er every area inside of the shell. After a few hours of cooling, it's ready for breakout, and now you can tr retrieve the bronze castings. I knock off all of the shell with a hammer or an air hammer, making sure to not hit the surface of the bronzes, because that will screw up the texture need to be fixed later on. 
And after all that work, this is really the first indication that you did everything right. The metal pour part can be devastating if it doesn't go well, which is a massive pain because it's the very last thing that you do in the process. And it's also really easy to erase all of your earlier efforts. Here's the first close up and view of all of that earlier work. Everything went well and it's pretty much a one to one duplicate of the tree branch section. After inspection, it's time to disassemble all of the work I did in earlier parts of the process. Then gets cut off the sprue system and cleaned up. Normally I would sandblast these, but I was being a little bit lazy. Instead I wire wheeled the leftover bits of ceramic coating off the grain. It gets more work, all of the shell will eventually be removed by the end of the project. And here you finally get to see the very detailed wood grain. It looks amazing and very sharp and detailed. This is the first metal inlay fit to see how well I did and how much the bronze shrank through the process. This is the first indication of how much and what kind of work I'll need to do to get this fit to fit back as intended. It's not terrible, but you can see the huge gap that's been created due to the shrinkage. Some people might wonder why I didn't leave the original wax just a little bit bigger and trim it in metal, but for me it's easier if it ends up small so I can fit the entire piece into the wood area that I carved out to see exactly where I need to add metal. If it were too big, I wouldn't be able to tell exactly where to trim and it would be far more guess and check work, which is a huge pain in the butt. If I can see the exact problem area, I just add a small bead weld along the edge to fill in that particular gap. This messes up some of the surface texture, but I'll be able to fix that later on once everything is fit correctly. And here you can see all of the filler rod added to the original metal to extend out the size of the whole casting. I ended up doing this around the entire edge of the bronze. And just as I did in the wax, I play the game again of endlessly fitting. This time I only work on the metal and never on the wood. It's tiny little adjustments over and over again. It was only a small amount of weld added so this isn't a huge job, but it's still a pain in the butt and quite a bit tedious. Along with sanding off the welds on the back, I also need to do this on the visible textured surface to get the plane of the wood back to the correct shape. Once that's done, I need to add the wood grain texture back into the metal to match it up to the original and the grain lines in the wood that line up with the bronze. For wood this is a pretty simple process because wood texture is very random and organic. It's easy to trick people's eyes. I do this with a combination of flat top carbides and small cutoff wheels to draw the grain lines back into the surface, trying to match them up with the other end of the, the real wood. When I was first learning to work on bronze sculptures, this part blew my mind. I had no idea you could just duplicate and replicate textures and add them back into metal in such a believable way. This process can get extremely complicated when you need to add de textures that are less organic or more uniform. Also this one is pretty simple since it's only one piece, but a lot of sculptures are many pieces and need to be welded back together. It's very important to be able to add textures back in to hide all of those seam lines to make it look like one continuous section of bronze. And now it looks pretty believable, almost like nothing happened. All roads seem to lead to polish with me. I've done it for many thousands of hours, so I guess that's just what I'll do again this time. I figured it would make a nice contrast with the more desaturated juniper wood. This is just a simple buffing compound and simple buffing wheels. Then I took it out into the sun to check out the shine. I think it looks pretty nice. And uh, sorry about the shakiness, I bought the only Panasonic camera without in-body stabilization. Makes it kind of, uh, kind of bad looking.
A few hours after I polished and filmed the last part, we got a nice load of snow. I think it makes a pretty cool backdrop for the tree branch and bronze. Also, it's sitting up against an old juniper tree with all of its dirt bark left on it. Pretty cool transformation from re weed tree, I think. And hopefully you liked this video. I have more strange projects lined up and other random foundry videos in the queue. This stuff takes a lot of work to put together, so it would mean a lot if you liked and subscribed, or also by sharing it if you know someone who would find this interesting. Also go back and check out some of my other videos. Each one is a different type of bronze casting or fine finish.